You think God is surprised when we mess up? <laughs> you think he's up in heaven going, oh, I can't believe he did that. What is he thinking? What a stupid move. You know, this ruins everything. I had all these great plans for him and he made that ridiculous choice and now I don't know what to do. <laughs> of course not. Isaiah 46 verse 10 says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. John 2.25, it says that Jesus knew what was in a man. And it says in Psalm 33 verse 12, the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart throughout all generations. Romans 8.28, all things work together for the good of those who love God. God is not surprised by our stupidity. He's not surprised when we messed up. He's not surprised when we fail. In fact, he accomplishes his purposes even in the midst of our mess-ups. Proof positive. 1 Kings chapter 12. King Solomon has died after 40 years as king. He was very wise in running the kingdom, but he wasn't so wise in his personal life. And he has one fear of what will happen in the future. And according to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they'll have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. So Solomon was very concerned about the leader who would follow him. Is he going to be a fool, or is he going to be faithful? Is he going to be wise, or is he going to be dumb? We get the answer to that here. And we also find out how God can work even in the midst of all that. Rehoboam, that's Solomon's son, went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. Now Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. You think he might have had some other kids. <laughs> but Rehoboam is the only one who's mentioned by name. Rehoboam is the one who becomes king. And you would think out of all the kids Solomon probably had, he could have handpicked somebody who would have been a, a wise person, a godly person. Let's see here. And it says he went to Shechem. And Shechem is an important place in the biblical narrative. Abraham worshipped there, Genesis 12, verse 6. Jacob built an altar and purchased land there, Genesis 33. There was also a conflict that broke out in Shechem in Genesis 34 when Shechem, Shechem's son Hammer raped Jacob's daughter Dinah and Simeon and Levi went in with their swords and put Shechem to the sword. And then later on Joseph was buried in Shechem in Joshua 24 verse 32. And it was also the geographical center of all the northern tribes. And so King Rehoboam, he must be in a very weak position diplomatically and politically because he's got to go to the geographic center of the northern tribes, the tribes that are going to be against him, in order to work things out. Verse 2, when Jeroboam, son of Nabat, heard this, he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon, he returned from Egypt. Remember what the prophet Ahijah told Jeroboam in 1 Kings 11, that God was going to tear the kingdom from Solomon and give Jeroboam ten tribes. So obviously Jeroboam is very interested in what happens at this summit meeting between Rehoboam and the northern tribes. Verse 3, so they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. So that's the first hint that it wasn't all paradise when Solomon reigned over Israel. He was wise as far as keeping the country safe from enemies, but he wasn't wise in the way he handled his people. He was very harsh. He had a strong labor force. He 
forced labor. They had to do it. And so they're saying we, you know, we're not saying Solomon was a terrible king, but he was harsh. And Rehoboam, if you lighten up a little bit, we'll always be your servants. And then verse 5, Rehoboam answered, go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. So it's probably why, I don't know if I would have said it like that, go away. <laughs> but it is a good idea to pray about the words of the people and see how you can lead and be a blessing. Verse 6, then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. He's, the first people he goes to are the experienced people, the diplomats, the statesmen. That, that, that's a good idea. Proverbs 19, verse 20, listen to advice and accept instruction, and in the end you will be wise. Solomon probably wrote that. Glad to see that Rehoboam's doing it for the moment. He said, how would you advise me to answer these people? Verse 7, they replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. So they're wise. They, they know that if he is benevolent and kind and compassionate toward the people, they're going to support him. They're going to be there for him. That's experience talking. But here's the problem. Look at verse 8. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. So he rejected this good advice even before he got any other advice. The, the right thing to do would have been to weigh the advice against the other advice he got and then make an informed decision. But he rejected it even before he heard another opinion. And that leads me to suspect that Rehoboam was more interested in hearing what he wanted to hear than in hearing the best possible advice. Verse 9, he asked the young men who grew up with him, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. <laughs> That's not a good idea. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I'll make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I'll scourge you with scorpions. I'm going to be even tougher than my dad. The young men are trying to say, you know, you gotta, you can't show weakness. You know, Solomon, your dad, he set an example of strictness. You got to show yourself a man by being even stricter. You got to put the fear of God into these people so that they'll obey you out of fear. That's the total opposite advice of the elders who said, serve these people and they'll always be there for you. Verse 12, three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders he followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I'll make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. You know, Rehoboam was not only a fool, he wasn't even a good politician because a good politician knows how to lie. <laughs> I'm not saying he should have lied, but if he intended on being strict, you don't tell him up front, I'm going to be even stricter than my old man. I mean, uh, diplomatically, tactfully, that was just not good advice. And he actually said this to the people. Verse 15, so the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahijah the Shilonite. And I think that's the key verse of the whole chapter. This turn of events was from the Lord. 
he knew this was going to happen, and he knew that this was going to be an occasion for division. It was his plan all along to tear Israel, the ten tribes of Israel and Judah and Benjamin, apart into two different nations. And this is the occasion that he knew it was going to happen, and he planned it that way. So in, I like what Spurgeon said. I, he explained it better than I do. So I'm just going to say what he said. Well, first I'm going to quote um, Dilday. He said, with a dozen rash words, Rehoboam, the bungling dictator, opened the door for 400 years of strife, weakness, and eventually the destruction of the entire nation. So with that short little speech, Rehoboam divided the country for the next 400 years. Nice going. And then Spurgeon says, Notice, dear friends, that God is in events which are produced by the sin and stupidity of men. This breakup of the kingdom of Solomon into two parts was the result of Solomon's sin and Rehoboam's folly, and yet God was in it. This thing is from me, saith the Lord. God had nothing to do with the sin or the folly, but in some way which we can never explain, in a mysterious way in which we are to believe without hesitation, God was in it all. That I, I think that explains it well. That it, it's a mystery, but God did not fall off the throne when Rehoboam spoke harshly to the people. He knew it was going to happen, and he made his plans, not necessarily based on what is going to happen, because God, God ordained it probably at the same time he knew it was going to happen, but still, that whole foreordination, predestination thing can be kind of hairy. What we do know is that this turn of events was from the Lord. God was in it. God had a plan. He had his purposes. God's purposes prevail even when we fail or even in the midst of our failures. That's a common theme in the Bible. Verse 16, when all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel. Look after your own house, David. Wow, that's, a, that's the second time the northern tribes made that sort of statement. Back in 2 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 20. Sorry, I got butterfingers. 2 Samuel 20, now a troublemaker named Sheba, son of Bichri, a Benjamite, happened to be there. He sounded the trumpet and shouted, we have no share in David, no part in Jesse's son, every man to his tent Israel. So this is the second rebellion of the northern tribes against Judah and Benjamin. So from now on, the ten northern tribes will be referred to as Israel or Samaria, and the southern kingdom will be referred to the southern, southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin. So the Israelites went home. Verse 17, but as for the Israelites who are living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. Verse 18, what does King Rehoboam do about this? He sent out Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor. Oh, that, that was not good. <laughs> So the people are rebelling against your forced labor policy. So what do you do? You send out the head of forced labor to try to beat him into obedience? Not happening. Instead of him beating them into obedience, they beat him to his death. All Israel stoned him to death. And that's when King Rehoboam realizes, this is serious. I... I need to back off. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. To Israel. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Verse 20, when all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. When Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, he mustered all Judah 
and the tribe of Benjamin, a hundred and eighty thousand able young men to go to war against Israel and to regain the kingdom for Rehoboam, son of Solomon. So Rehoboam says, well, my first attempt failed. I'm going to do everything I can to preserve the union. And so he gathers together a humongous military expedition, 180,000 people. But verse 22, listen to this. This word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God. Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, this is what the Lord says, do not go up to fight against your brothers, the Israelites, go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again as the Lord had said. This is so interesting because Shemaiah the prophet shows up for the first time and the last time. We never hear from this guy ever again, and yet God used him in a powerful way to avert a civil war between the north and the south. Amazing. Let me read this note that I have here about that. See if I can find that note. <laughs> but basically, it said something similar to that. Here it is by Spurgeon. Here is one Shemaiah. Some of you never heard of him before. Perhaps you'll never hear of him again. He appears once and then he vanishes. He comes and he goes. Only fancy this one man constraining to bring peace to 180,000 chosen men, warriors ready to fight against the house of Israel by giving to them in very plain words the simple command of God. Why have we not this power? Peradventure, brethren, we do not always speak in the name of the Lord or speak God's word as God's word. If we're simply tellers of our own thoughts, why should men mind us? So in other words, this guy appears and we never see him ever again, but he people responded because he spoke the words of God, not the words of himself. I think what we're going to do is we're going to come back tomorrow and, no, wait a minute, I think I'll finish this. Verse 25, then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built up Peniel. Now Shechem is going to be not only the center of the Sumerian kingdom or Israelite kingdom, it's also going to be the place where they sometimes meet for military briefs and worship. Verse 26, Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they'll again give allegiance to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah. They'll kill me and return the king Rehoboam. Now wait a second. Are you? He's doubting the word of the Lord. Ahijah the prophet said, I'm going to give you ten tribes. And if you obey me, I'll bless you. You don't have to worry about that. And why doesn't Jeroboam consult Ahijah the prophet? We're going to find out that he doesn't consult Ahijah the prophet until everything is falling apart near the end of his reign or near the end of his particular situation. He should be calling on God now. Lord, what am I going to do? What if the people go back to Jerusalem and worship once a year, and then they decide to stay there and don't come back, and, I, they, and then they gather together a force and kill me? He should have prayed about it. should have consulted wise people about it. Well, verse 28, he did seek advice, but he didn't seek it from wise people. Instead, he sought advice for the evil he wanted to do, not the good he wanted to do. Look, the king made two golden calves. So the advice he was given was to commit idolatry. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to make religion more convenient for you. I'm going to make devotion to God so much easier that you're never going to have to go to Jerusalem. Look at these golden calves. Here are your gods, O Israel. 
who brought you up out of Egypt. So it's very possible that these calves were not meant to be different gods, but that they were to be material representations of the true God. But doesn't that go against the Ten Commandments? I mean, listen to Exodus chapter 20. It says it in verse 4, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers of the third and fourth generation. So, don't do it! But you know what? He did it anyway. He set up one God in Bethel to the south and the other in Dan to the north. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to the north to worship the other. Verse 31, Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people. That goes against the word of God. The Levites are supposed to be the priests. Of course, there's no way he's going to get Levites to do this false worship. It says, even though they were not Levites. <laughs> Verse 32, he instituted a festival on the 15th day of the 8th month. So he's creating his own religion. Like the festival held in Judah and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves he had made. And at Bethel he installed priests at the high places he had made. You're not supposed to put up high places. You're not supposed to worship calves. Verse 33, on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, a month of his own choosing, his own choosing. Did you catch that? Man-made religion of his own choosing, not following God. We should follow God whether it's convenient or not convenient. We should follow Christ whether it's convenient or not convenient. So he offered sacrifices on the altar he had built at Bethel, and he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. Well, you know what's going to happen. God is going to send a prophet to speak against what Jeroboam is doing. But the main point of the chapter is that even when it seems like things are coming apart at the seams, we don't have to doubt for a second that God is in the midst of it, working to fulfill and accomplish his purposes, even if those purposes are mysterious, even if those purposes are sometimes scary, because it is God's intended purpose over the next 400 years to slowly reduce the size of Israel, reduce the size of Judah, and then have Nebuchadnezzar come in and conquer them because they have rejected the word of the Lord and the word of the prophets. That's God's purpose. But if you repent and turn to God, God is in that too. And he brings grace and mercy and forgiveness. And we're going to see at different times in Israel's history, there will be kings who repent. There will be kings who obey the word of the Lord. At least in Judah, not so much in Israel. I think Israel has 19 kings. And after Solomon, not a single one did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Judah, on the other hand, they had 17 kings and... A number of them, I think eight of them at least, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, generally speaking. But if you give your life to Christ, you don't have to worry about, oh no, what if God's not there for me if I make this choice? God is in the midst of all situations. God's not going to fall off the throne of heaven if you choose this job rather than that job. Or if you mess up and have to repent. God knows everything. Give your life to Christ and trust him with confidence. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We'll be back tomorrow with 1 Kings chapter 13.